Hello, my name is James Arroyo, and today we're going to be talking about Chapter 11, Speaking with Confidence. This is the thing that tends to be the most challenging with a lot of intro to uh, public speaking students, because unlike math or science or English, where you either know it or you don't, with public speaking, you can practice and prepare and deliver, but a lot of times the biggest challenge for a lot of people is overcoming public speaking anxiety. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be better understanding public speaking anxiety, as well as strategies to reduce public speaking anxiety. This is one of those things that is a process that we will continue to develop. We will continue to reduce this public speaking anxiety. But Again, it is a process, and it is a very common thing. We all experience some level of public speaking anxiety, and what we're going to learn is that that's not necessarily a bad thing, and it is something that can be managed. So, let us begin. But before we begin in public speaking anxiety, first, I want to talk about something real quick. Ethos, pathos, and logos. Pathos is the emotional path that we take people down, also emotional appeals. Logos is logic through evidence and reasoning. And then we have ethos. And this is the one that we're going to be addressing most today. This is a speaker's credibility. What is it about a speaker that makes them so credible? Maybe they are well learned in this field maybe they're a doctor maybe they're they have a phd maybe they are a masters maybe they have just gone through a lot of schooling maybe they have their own experiences but one of the big things that creates ethos is our delivery you could say that i am uh a, par a person can say that they know all about this topic, and they may know a lot, but for a lot of audiences, it doesn't matter so much what you say, but how you say it. And ethos is very much improved through our delivery, but... So, ethos is defined as the character that is attributed to the speaker by listeners based on what the speaker says and does in the speech. So, if they say that they're an expert, that can build credibility or ethos. If they say, uh, if they use um, like, um, I don't know, I'm not sure, but does that communicate ethos? No, in fact, it could diminish it. Character, uh, but this is the character that you project during the speaking situation. So how you present your information to the audience and how the audience receives it affects ethos give you an example if you are speaking to a an audience that is full of let's say democrats but then you start discussing a lot of republican issues that may diminish our credibility and this communicates the point that a lot of times our ethos is based on how the audience receives information. But what does someone with public speaking communicate? How do they communicate? Let's think about this. So we're going to watch a video and this is going to and look to see what are some of the specific behaviors that he does that communicates his public speaking anxiety and how does this affect his ethos? Excellent. What were some of the things specifically that were communicating this public speaking anxiety? Some of these include the fidgeting of hands, his wavering voice. Also, one that you may not have noticed was his consistent dropping of the ball. Let me clarify this. Let me clarify this. Let me clarify this. What that does is that shows, oh, Maybe I'm not prepared enough. I think I need to say this in a clearer way. So it is not just 
how we say these things and those the bug eyes and like you know freaking out like non-verbally but also we can communicate our public speaking anxiety verbally one of the big ways that we do this is through verbal fillers but how does this improve his ethos his credibility or how does it reflect his credibility i should say because it doesn't in fact improve it in fact it diminishes it and did does he mean to do this is this something that he intends to do could he be credible but still be incredibly nervous absolutely so as listeners it is we want to be sure that we are not creating assumptions of people that just because they're nervous that they're uncredible but on the flip side as public speakers we want to try to communicate confidence so that we communicate credibility so that the audience doesn't have to reserve their um in uh, first impressions speech anxiety and communication anxiety are two sides of the same coin where speech anxiety or public speaking anxiety is in the public communication anxiety is in communication all communication situations so it is an uh, communication apprehension is an individual level of fear associated uh, or, or anxiety associated with real or anticipated communication with another person or persons some things to break down on this First, it is an individual level of anxiety or fear. We all have varying levels of anxiety and we can all learn a great, so therefore we can all learn a great deal from this class. And for those who feel like maybe they do not experience public speaking anxiety, I will direct you to a quote by Mark Twain. Mark Twain once said, there are two types of uh, speakers in this world. There are people who fear public speaking and there are liars. Everyone experiences some level of public speaking anxiety, but some people may experience more, some people may experience less, but both can manage it. Also, real or anticipated communication with another person or persons. Just the simple act of anticipating a communication situation can create this, public, this uh, communication apprehension. Are there communication situations that you feel apprehension outside of public speaking? I have no doubt. Have you ever been nervous for an interview? Have you ever been nervous on a first date or talking to a new friend that you are trying to make? These are all situations that we experience communication apprehension and a big reason for that is because we want to succeed. If we did not want to succeed in a public speech, guess what? You would not feel nervous. You would simply go, hello, my name is James. I'm going to talk to you about chocolate. Chocolate's great. Thank you. And you're done. Is there any real need to be nervous? No. So nervousness is not a bad thing. Communication apprehension is not a bad thing. But the more we engage in communication situa situations which we are apprehensive of, it will allow us to grow in these situations and feel less uh, apprehensive or anxious the next time we approach that communication situation. So there are three types of apprehension. There are trait apprehension. Some people are just nervous in many types of situations. This is attributed as being shy. That is okay. This is one that is sometimes harder to manage, but it is not something that is entirely impossible of being non, not managed. Someone from this category may be anxious after this class. Yeah, sorry, after, uh, even after we've had all this practice in public speaking. But, so it is a more continuous process, but it is something that can still be managed. Then we have state anxiety. This is nervousness immediately before and sometimes even during a speech or a communication situation. 
This is not something that is ruminating on the mind and therefore making someone more nervous. Then we have scrutiny fear. This is nervousness when being when someone is being watched or observed or evaluated. This is when you have someone evaluating your actual speech. Oh, I don't know. Something like this class where I would be evaluating you. But it is also something to consider that no one ever wants to see you fail. So these are the three types of apprehension. Now we move on to what communication apprehension can lead to or public speaking anxiety, what it can lead to. Physiological reactions and psychological reactions. Let's jump right in. So there are many different types of physiological reactions. Your heartbeat could start racing, sweating, nausea, difficulty breathing, dry mouth, shaking and twitching, wringing of hands, nervous laugh, chest pain, fainting, verbal fillers, and all sorts of stuff. N palms sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy, vomit on the sweater already, mom spaghetti. But what does it say about us if we experience these physiological reactions to this external stimuli, this situation? What does it say about us? Does it say that we are less than? Does it say that we are bad or insufficient or incapable? The answer is no. Of course it doesn't. This is just a physiological reaction to external stimuli. So just like if you're hot, you get sweaty. If you are sad, you cry. If you are mad, you get frustrated, you uh, start getting hot. If you are what if you are cold, you start shivering. We have to start thinking of these physiological reactions as things that just happen to us, things that can be managed through self-monitoring, being like, oh, I'm twitching my hands, I have to stop that. Oh, I'm nervous laughing, I need to stop that. Verbal fillers, yeah, I need to stop that. But they are things that just happen, and they are not something that we should feel ashamed or embarrassed about because that can only make things worse. Now we move on to psychological reactions. Psychological reactions, the biggest one is procrastination. Do we start things that we don't want to or don't like to do first? No. What did you do right when you woke up? I don't know about you, but for me, I decided, you know what, let's just check my phone. Let's watch some TV. Let's do these things instead of doing work, working out. We do not like to do things that we don't like to, uh, well, we, we like to put off things that we don't like to do. This is especially true with communication situations. Is there a conflict? that you have been avoiding, that you've been procrastinating with for a significant other. If this is the case and this is continuing, and this continues until, you know, until infinite, then the relationship could dissolve at that point. So we want to be sure that we are understanding that this is a psychological reaction due to communication apprehension, and what happens if we continue to procrastinate, the communication situation dissolves, and does my fear get better or does it get worse when I avoid the situation? Or does it stay the same? It only gets worse. We start thinking about it and consistent and uh, ruminating about it and making it a bigger deal in our head until we don't want to do it even more. Then we have negative self-talk, and this can play into this part as well. What are some of the things that we say about ourselves before we start speaking? Some of the negative self-talk we can experience are things like, 
oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do awful. Everyone's going to judge me. Everyone's going to laugh. Uh, I'm so not prepared. Why didn't I prepare more? Oh my gosh, James is going to give me an F. Would you say this about anyone in the rest, in this entire class? Hey, you know, Steve, you're going to fail. You're going to do awful. James is going to give you an F. We're all going to laugh at you. Of course not. So why is it that we understand that it is not okay to communicate this information to others, but we do not understand, or we or we may not uh, internalize that we should not communicate, we should not deal this self-harm to ourselves. It can only make it worse. Not to mention, no one ever really thinks this way. We would always like, we would prefer to see someone succeed than to fail. We have blanking, just simply blanking out. How do we avoid this? Practice. Moving on. Adrenaline. It can also lead to this sort of fight or flight reaction. What can this lead to? Or well, so what? What? Uh, what sort of behavior does this lead to in a public speaking situation? If you have fight, engaging with this communication situation, addressing this problem that you've been ruminating on, communicating the best you can in a public speaking situation. What would a flight reaction be? Uh, what would a flight reaction be in a communication situation or a public speaking situation? My, I am not able to show up to class today because my dog or cat or porcupine died today. So I can't come to class. Don't get me wrong, there are sometimes situ situations that will occur on speech days, but this could also be a psychological reaction based on this adrenaline. So there are a lot of other reasons. We also may have a lack of speaking experience. We are uncertain about these situations and therefore we try to avoid them. How do we avoid this? Practice. We may have a prior negative experience. How can we compensate for this negative experience? By having positive experiences, aka practice. We also may have low self-esteem about public speaking. This could be either because at one point in your life, someone may have said, you are not good at this. First of all, is this evaluation Someone who you believe has exceeding levels of skill in public speaking. Second of all, does this eval does this was this a long time ago, and does that reflect how you are now? Usually not to either of these. So we sometimes place more meaning onto the negative stuff we hear than the positive things we hear. Has any? Does anyone ever feel weird when they receive a compliment? Me too. Someone says, you were so good. You're, you're amazing at this. Thank you. And I say, oh, yeah, okay, I guess you're welcome. Ugh. So we sometimes reject the positive and we internalize the negative. So we want to try to avoid this. And then we have a self-fulfilling prophecy. We all may have, may or may not have heard of this, but this is in general where attitude, an attitude or a belief leads to behavior, which then leads to an outcome. Give you an example. Let's say that I feel like I will be forever alone. No one will ever love me. I am so sad. No matter what, I will never find this person. So, I have an attitude. How does that lead to behavior? Am I extroverted? Am I going to go out and try to look for people? Am I going to try to, you know, if, when I am communicating with someone, am I going to be confident? Not particularly. And as a result, 
that may lead to an outcome that reinforces that initial attitude. I won't hang out with that person anymore. In the same way, we have public speeches. An attitude. I am not good at public speeches. So therefore, that leads to behavior. Instead of working on my speech, maybe I'll work on other classes. Maybe I'll, you know, do something else. Then, in the actual speech, I may be less confident. And, therefore, that leads to an outcome. But this can also be positive. If I think that I am going to do great in this public speech, that may lead to confidence in the speaking situation and then therefore lead to a positive outcome, which then reinforces that initial attitude. So this can be a reason for communication apprehension, but it can also be a way that we reduce communication apprehension, depending on the input, depending on the attitude. Then we have a some people may have fear of being the center of attention. This can develop through just simple trait apprehension. But it could also be just due to a lack of experience, and that requires practice. There could be concern about being judged by the audience. I have already said this. Who brings tomatoes to a public speech? No one ever brings tomatoes to a public speech. No one is ever there to judge you. People would rather see a good speech versus a bad speech every single time. And no person ha will ever come to a speech just so that they can judge you. And even feeling subordinate, this ties into a low self-esteem in public speaking. But we want to definitely reduce this and an excessive self-focus, focusing on every little small thing that we do. What is a basketball player, as they're shooting, what are they thinking about, or any athlete? They are usually thinking about absolutely nothing. They are thinking about the, they're visualizing the ball going into the hoop, and this can actually lead to some of those funny moments in sports where the person who's been hitting f uh, free throws all day gets into their head on the free throw that matters at the end of the game and misses it. So we want to be sure that we are avoiding this excessive self-focus. We also have high stakes. What are the stakes of a public speaking uh, of a public speech in a public speaking class? You don't do as well on one speech. You get a lot of good feedback, and therefore you improve. We also have also something to keep in mind. Well, yeah. Also, feeling different than the audience. Perceived differences in sex, class, interests, etc. can lead to some anxiety. If you feel like you are different from the audience, then you may feel uncertain about how the audience is going to react. And there is some degree of unpredictability. This again talks to uncertainty. There are some areas of unpredictability. Will the technology work? How will the audience react? Will I do well? Will I remember what I say? How do we overcome these? By practicing these situations and therefore getting better and reducing this anxiety. So a lot of these involve practice, but there's one more that is failure, a fear of failure. However, this is something that we really shouldn't try to quote unquote avoid. And there's a big reason for this, because you can either succeed, but failure is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it can sometimes be an amazing thing. It can help us grow, and it can help us learn what is going to work, what is not going to work, and lead us to a success. Let me tell you a story. So there was a business called Kodak. 
and Kodak started with uh, doing big uh, plates. Basically, that was how they did it. Uh, they did photography plates. But uh, Eastman Kodak, the leader, the founder of Kodak, they decided, you know what? I'm going to try something different. Even though this is working, let's try something different. Do paper, paper film. It was a little bit lower quality, but he insisted on doing it. And as a result, he created a whole new market of amateur photographers and dominated the market for the next 20 years. Then a new technology came out. It was color printing, but it was still in its very fundamental state, uh, basic stages, fundamental stages, and because of this, it was iffy. Should he jump into this immediately? He was already successful in his paper, so why should he jump into color? He decided to jump into color anyway at the beginning and develop this technology. He, he failed multiple, multiple times for the next 10 years trying to figure this out. Was he a failure? No, he was not a failure. What he was doing was he was failing forward. Failing, but learning about the experience, pushing himself outside of his comfort zone, outside of what is safe, and braving failure for the potential for success. And eventually, he developed a really good color print and dominated the market for the next 20 years. Then a new technology came about, digital photography. And what did Eastman Kodak do? Well, Eastman Kodak was dead. But what did the Kodak company do? They waited. They had a very lucrative film business and they did not want to use this new digital technology because it may uh, hurt their bottom line. So they waited. They waited. This is failing backwards. It's not engaging with a problem. It's not dealing with something. It's not braving failure and instead being resigned and complacent in our success. Years passed, years passed, until finally other companies started developing digital, digital photography and Eastman uh, and Kodak wanted to jump in, but by that time it was too late. The, the train had already left the station and they were not able to catch up. So we can either fail forward or fail backward. Failing forward is the best way of going about this. And that Kodak was not successful in spite of their failures. They were successful as a result of their, their failures. They learned from them and they were able to move forward and they were only not successful when they were not, when their fear overwhelmed them and they were not able to brave failure for potential success. Cognitive restructuring can be one strategy for dealing with public speaking or communication anxiety. Identifying objectively what you think. Identify if there are any inconsistencies between perception and reality. And then replace destructive thinking with supportive thinking. One of the things that I have a lot of anxiety about is conflict situations. Especially with those people I care about. I'm sure that this is a common one for a lot of people. So one thing that I, so I would in this situation identify objectively what I think. Yeah, I don't like 
conflict because it usually devolves into an argument. It is about arguing. It's about yelling. And, you know, it just hurts people's feelings. But there are some inconsistencies between perception and reality in this. Because if I engage in conflict productively and listen to the other, what the other person has to say, then it doesn't have to devolve into a screaming match. It doesn't have to be an argument or a battle. And people don't have to have their feelings hurt as long as I am not trying to hurt the other person. So I could, so I remove that destructive thinking and start thinking of supportive. You know what? This could be a way that we could solve this problem that we are both experiencing. We could end up with a win-win scenario. In the same way, what are some of the destructive, or what are some of the thing? Uh, identify objectively what you are thinking about public speaking. Are there inconsistencies between perception and reality? Do you think like people are going to judge you? That is not really the case. That is not that is an inconsistency between perception and reality. So we could then remove that and support it with something construct uh, supportive. That people aren't judging you. People are supporting you. They want to see you succeed. Because they've been seeing you in this class. They've heard your stories. They've heard who you are. And they have identified with you. So they want, if they've identified with you, they've seen a little bit of themselves in you. So they want to see themselves succeed. And therefore, they want to see you succeed. So we want to be sure that we are engaging in some of this cognitive restructuring, especially in regards to public speaking. But this is not just exclusive to public speaking. This can be applied to first date situations, interview situations, uh, friend situations, dealing with re uh, relatives that maybe you can uh, are having a hard time communicating with. So there are some strategies of building confidence before a public speech or even a communication situation. Preparing well, that helps, reduces uncertainty about the situation. Also, visualizing success. Seeing yourself succeed gives you positive self-talk instead of negative self-talk. Avoiding gimmicks. Things like looking over the people's, uh, over everyone's heads in a public speaking situation, that doesn't really work. Looking at people, uh, imagining people in their underwear, that's even worse. That seems distracting to me. Also, breathing and releasing. <sighs> Taking a deep breath has, is very important in regards to not only our physical health, but to our mental health. Simply breathing can help us just get out of our heads a little bit. Minimizing what you are memorizing can help as well. This is why extemporaneous speaking, aka also known as memorizing the main points of what you're going to say, but not memorizing word for word, is what is exemplified, what, what, is what is exemplified by this point, that we are mem memorizing the main points, but we are not memorizing word for word. Also, practice out loud, because in a practice situation, we are trying to simulate the environment as best as we can. So, are you going to telepathically tell the audience what your speech is about? Not particularly. I hope, well, that'd be cool, but we don't usually do that, or at least the majority of the audience doesn't do that. So, practice out loud and customize your practice. Change things up so that you have multiple avenues of how to tell your speech and that you are not committed to just one idea and you're able to adapt in the situation. Now let's talk about during. Acknowledge that you are experiencing some level of fear. Experiencing some level of fear is natural. It is because we want to succeed. So by understanding and acknowledging it, we are less uncertain about this situation. So we feel better. Also engaging in positive self-talk. You can do this. You're going to do great. 
breathing in the middle of the uh, speech will help as well. Pauses. Don't apologize for being nervous. This, first of all, as we've talked about, is dropping the ball. But it also diminishes our ethos by saying, oh, I'm so sorry. And after the speech, evaluate the your performance. This is critical because not only does it give you things to work on moving forward, but it also frames the entire speech as a pro process, not an outcome. Have you gotten better at certain things? Have you gotten better at basketball? Have you gotten better at academics? Have you gotten better at et cetera, et cetera? Of course, because you are on a learning curve. You are engaging in a process. Guess what? Your first speech will not be, will probably be or could be the worst speech you've get, you'll give in this class. In fact, that is good because you will be improving throughout this speech, uh, throughout this uh, class. So your first speech should be the worst speech, but it is. we have to evaluate it and understand that it is a process and not just an outcome. Because if we think of it as an outcome, we think, oh my gosh, I was awful. I was an F. I didn't do well. I am bad. Whereas if you think about it about it as a process, you think, you know what, I didn't do so well on this, so I could do better on that. I didn't do so, do, do so well on this, but you know what, I actually did okay on this, so I think that I should continue doing this. You see, it's not about the person, it's not about the outcome, it is about the process of development. So... These are the big ways to improve our uh, how to build confidence. And also, we've talked about some of the ways to understand our anxieties. By understanding our anxieties, we are more likely to reduce them. And by engaging some of these strategies for building confidence, we will be more successful in our public speeches. Thank you all again for listening in, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.